I mean, ultimately, it seems that if you're introspective about life, it all it leads to a kind of acceptance, a deeper and deeper acceptance of the whole of it. There it, again, I want to be cautious about acceptance because it almost says that you can't change it. Ah, yeah. It's it's sort of embracing the struggle and embracing the journey is the way that I would put it. So you ultimately feel the journey isn't just something that happens to you. you of course, you, you shape it. You shape it. Remember how I was saying that Boston is the best place and the best time to live in right now, you know, in the history of humanity? <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the way that I think about this is that <clears throat> if you look at the, the whole of cosmos, where would you rather be? If you're just a bunch of molecules, roughly your you know, biomass, where would you rather be? Would you rather be a rock on Mars? Eh, probably not. Would you rather be in a black hole? Mm, probably not. Would you rather be in an exploding supernova? Maybe, that might be interesting. But being on Earth is an awesome solar system, an awesome planetary system, an awesome you know, place to be in. Across all of space-time, it's a pretty good place to be in as a bunch of molecules. If you are a bunch of molecules on Earth today, being an animal with you know, some kind of awareness of the, th the stuff around you is wonderful. Being a human among all animals is amazing because you have all this introspection. And being a human who's young, fit, athletic, smart, etc. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you have so much to be happy for. Yeah. Beyond that, being surrounded by a bunch of awesome people that you interact with all the time. I mean, I feel blessed to interact with the people I know, with the friends I have, the dinners that I have, all of this, the students that I interact with, I'm so blessed. And the last little little blip in this awesomeness of local maximum, the last little blip comes from being kind, being grateful and being kind. I don't know if you remember that little prayer that I described last time of thank you for all the good you've given me and give me strength to give unto others with the same love that you've given to me. And, and the, the whole point of that is being grateful and being kind. What does that do? From a purely egoistic perspective, it makes the people around you happier mm -hmm. and it takes that little maximum a little bit further because you'll be surrounded by happy people, by being kind. That's the purely egoistic view. And the purely altruistic view, or maybe it's egoistic as well, is that it just it's good to give, it feels good to give. Yeah. Like basically watching somebody who's touched by what you said, watching somebody who's like appreciating a rapid response or a generous offer or just random acts of kindness is so fulfilling. So evolutionarily, we were selected for that. There's just such a good feeling that comes from that. You know, it's fascinating to think you said Boston is the best place and talking about kindness that the very thought that Boston is the pl best place in the universe <laughs> is almost, it's, it's a kind of a gravitational field. Uh, like it, the, you, your thought and your very life in itself is a kind of field that makes that real. Yeah, so yeah. the, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and it, by, by, by claiming it's the best and thinking it's the best, it becomes the best. And you make others, it's, 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 a for, it's not a force that just applies to your own cognition. Exactly. It applies to the others around you. And then suddenly you live in an even better place. Yeah, and because it, you, it, it creates the reality, the yeah. actual reality, that the, the social reality. Exactly. Then it molds the environment. Exactly. You, you, what's one of the coolest things about you, I think, is uh, you represent uh, the best of MIT, like the spirit of MIT. There is, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm fortunate enough to be able to talk to you because, um, you know, there's a kind of uh, cynicism about academia in parts that I think is undeserved and that, that, that there's a, you know, MIT, of course, but academic institutions is a sacred place where ideas can flourish and just in the same very way that you're talking about is both kindness and uh, curiosity and that like that weird thing that happens when a bunch of curious descendants of apes get together <laughs> and just like get excited and this, this uh, 
uh, ripple effect that happens. I mean, that's the, the most beautiful aspect of MIT. People might think like competition and grants and like uh, position, like you said, the rat race, but like underneath it all is is these curious human beings inspiring younger human beings. And there's this uh, ripple effect that happens. And I'm so glad that, I mean, I'm glad that you, that, that you that I get a chance to record this <laughs> because it inspires so many other students and so many other people uh, to do the same, to embrace the, the inner curious creature that it's not about the race. So, so let's talk about the negative. Let's talk about, <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious, I'm serious. Yes. Well, you know, you have to embrace the good and the bad. So let's talk about <laughs> as, the negative. As the grief comes out. <laughs> let's, let's address it. Um, so why do people want positions of power? Why do people want, you know, more money, more power, more this, more that? Remember the part where I was saying, if you know who you are, what other people think about you makes no difference to you. It only teaches you about them. Many people feel um, defined themselves. They feel instantiated through the eyes of others. So being in a position of power makes them feel better about themselves. Who knows what other kind of struggles they might have that creates that need to feel better about themselves. But they have a bunch of struggles and everybody has a bunch of struggles. And every time I see somebody behaving poorly, I'm basically thinking, well, they're in a tough spot right now and, and it's okay. It, you know, I can, I can kind of see how I would behave badly in other circumstances as well. So I think if you take away that sort of having to prove yourself in the eyes of others, life becomes so much easier. So when I first became a professor at MIT, I started wearing adult clothes. I, was, I had my <laughs> like, you know, I mean, before- You became a serious person, quote unquote. I, I basically had, you know, I, I, would, I would always like go around in my rollerblades and my shorts and a t-shirt. And eventually I was a professor like, oh, I bought all these khaki pants and, you know, these nice, like, you know, shirts with like, you know, what do they call it, the uh, patterns. And I was like, you know, dressing with my nice belt every day, showing up. Okay. And then a, a few months later, I was like, I can't stand it. <laughs> and I just went back to my rollerblades yeah. <laughs> and my, my t-shirts and my shorts. And it was this struggle of sort of not feeling that I fit in. I was uh, so intimidated by all of my colleagues like just watching their incredible achievements, like the person next to me and the person, you know, the floor below me. I was like, oh my God, like uh, what, what, they clearly made a mistake. What the heck am I doing here? How will I ever live up to these people's standards? And um, eventually you grow up to realize that um, the way that other, I grew up to realize that the way that other people perceived my work was very similar to the way that I perceived other people's work as flawless. I knew all of the flaws in my work. I knew the limitations. I knew what I hadn't managed to achieve. And what I saw was maybe a third of the way of what I was trying to achieve. And I saw everything as flawed. What they saw, what, is, what I had achieved, they didn't see what I hadn't achieved. They only saw the one third down, which was pretty good in their eyes. So they all respected me and I was feeling miserable about myself. I was like, I'm not worthy. And I think that th this is a cognitive problem that we have. We kind of, um, it's kind of like when we're talking about artificial general intelligence, HEI, of sort of, we kind of have this definition that anything that machines can do is not intelligent right. and anything that they can't do is intelligent. Therefore, we narrow, 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 narrow the field of what intelligence truly really means. And as soon as machines achieve something, it's not intelligent anymore. I feel like I was doing the same thing with myself. As soon as I could solve something, it was the kind of thing that a kid like me could solve. And therefore it was kind of easy. But to the others, it seemed hard. Yeah. But to me, it seemed easy. So it was this kind of thing that everything that my colleagues were doing, seemed impossible to me. But everything that I was doing seemed impossible to them. So it was that realization that sort of made me mature into sort of a not more confident, but more comfortable human being. 